Nico. The very name brings up an appreciation of video games as a medium of narrative expression. Its accolades speak for themselves, and its continued presence in the upper echelon of games favored by the industry's top creatives says more than any number of bloated Game of the Year award placards ever can. It's easier than you think to win 100 Game of the Year awards in an era of 10,000 different publications, but to do what Eco did is something only a handful of games manage every generation. It was arguably the culmination of the fifth generation, and its imprint on the sixth's design's sensibilities makes a strong case for it having set that generation's standard. Although Eco is remembered fondly inside and outside of the video game medium as a bastion of its art form's validation as such, what is often lost in the Eco conversation is the appreciation of its form. A lot of words get thrown around to show how Eco broke the rules for how to make games, but there might actually not be a game which is a better example of how playing to your medium's strength elevates your work. Something important to understand, to make a good game, or movie, or song, or book, or whatever, is that different mediums have different strengths. There are things they can do well and things they simply can't. A medium is a tool, and like it is for any tool, it is almost never a good idea to make a medium do something it's not made to do. Games generally live and die on the basis of their interactive components, which is why the Majora's Masks and Silent Hills still remain resonant, whereas many of the more visually appealing games of recent years have not. Visuals are nice, but they aren't form-exclusive or independent of technology, so long-term appreciation is probably not going to be dependent on it, whereas the interactive experience nearly is, will be, and isn't, given that games have been around for hundreds of thousands of years. Any best video games of all times lists are going to overrepresent games which above all else highlight the strengths of video games over other mediums. So, they are statistically likely to feature Eco. To players worldwide, it's grown far beyond its roots as a niche cult darling having been re-released and remastered, having been iterated on with spiritual sequels in one of the best appreciated games ever made, and another all-time heavyweight game which is certain to obtain a latent appreciation when people go back to it. Eco's influence has been cited by creators as celebrated as Zelda's Aichi Aonuma, Half-Life's Mark Laidlaw, Hideo Kojima's Hideo Kojima, Naughty Dog, and that game company, to name some, and it's the reason from software's Hidetaka Miyazaki, arguably the most celebrated of all contemporary game designers, wanted to make video games. Different creatives have taken different things from the game, and after 30 minutes, what I want you to take away from this video will be an appreciation for Eco as a video game on its merit as a video game. We'll be talking about its visuals, its sound design, its development backstory, and all that, but its purity of devotion to form will be the highlight of this video. Hello everyone, and welcome to the ACR Aesthetics Show's in-depth look at Eco. I know I say this every time, but if this is your first exposure to the game, I seriously discourage further viewing. Eco is a very special experience and warrants its first digestion being in its intended format. If you've done that, or if you're a cool person like me who doesn't listen to disclaimers, grab yourself a cup of coffee and strap in as we take a look back at Eco. Eco started development in 1997 when its director, Fumito Ueda, began conceptualizing an experience where a tall girl and a short boy hold hands and have an adventure based on a feeling he got after watching a commercial where a mother held the hand of a child. Prior to this, Ueda had worked on Enemy Zero as an animator and animation would be his directorial signature. Although they are very different games, Enemy Zero is quite possibly the most important of all of Eco's influences, because Ueda brought over from it an affinity for lighting, its brand of sound design, its mature appeal, and use of cinematic cutscenes. Another influential game was the cinematic platformer Another World, which, in order to play more like a movie and like Eco would do, forewent the use of any sort of heads-up display. 
Ueda has also noted Flashback, Virtua Fighter, the OG Prince of Persia, and Lemmings as inspirations. Prior to getting the game greenlit, Ueda created a 3-minute demonstration video to convey the intent of the game, and after getting it greenlit, Ueda has gone on record to say that having this video helped the team stay focused long term, because they had a feeling for what the end product was going to be. Eco's overall development time was 4 years, but the game almost did not materialize because 2 years in, it became unworkable due to it having clocked the PlayStation 1's upper processing limit. After some reflection, the team decided they had three options. 1. Scrap the project, not gonna happen. 2. Reduce the scope of the project, also not gonna happen, because they were very devoted to Ueda's vision. 3 continue making the game and explore more options as they become available. And that other option would arrive with a PlayStation 2, best console of all time as voted by yours truly. Something Eco embodies very much is the director stamp. A creative vision has become almost a dirty thing to say about video games because of how much they really are a group effort, and they are, but a brutal truth is that not all team members are created equal. That's not to put down anyone who answers to the director, or to say their efforts are imminently replaceable, but without Ueda, there is no eco, and I don't know if that's true of any other staff member, except maybe producer Kenji Kaido, and that's only because of his fighting to give Ueda the creative freedom the project demanded. Ueda's job on this title were lead animator, lead designer, and project director, and he also painted the game's cover. As much as his shadow looms over every aspect of the game, it's ironic that his style is so minimalistic. You see Ueda in how much is not there. He said himself in an interview that when you make a game, you naturally make something you'd like to play, and if his games are reflections of himself, Ueda is absolutely a minimalist, and minimalism is a very difficult principle because it forces you to be hyper alert of every signal which every aspect of your game sends at every moment. It means Eco's animations are hand-done rather than motion-captured. It means you include a made-up language so that no region suffers miscommunication because of bad localization. It means you need to guide the player at every step, because if you don't, they'll be lost without anything to do. No grinding to kill time or NPCs to talk to. If they can't advance, then it's because you didn't place the camera where they saw the next clue, or because the lighting effect hit a specific lever they had to pull. When there is nothing but the essentials, those essentials are lifting a far heavier load than usual. Eco's design had three guiding principles. To make a unique game, to have an aesthetic which at all time felt artistic, and to play out in a realistic setting. To achieve these, subtract design was utilized. Basically, game elements were removed whenever they interfered with the game's reality, and this includes all interface elements. This includes all gameplay sections other than strictly escaping the castle, until the end of course, and reducing the game's enemies to one type. And although this no doubt helped the game on many many fronts, Ueda himself has stated that in retrospect they might have taken this concept a bit too far, a mistake he was adamant about not having brought back for Shadow of the Colossus. While Ueda was visually interested in the concept of a short boy holding hands with a tall girl, on a gameplay level, he was interested in the idea of touching and interacting with the game's AI. Ueda described Eco as not a video game, but a story told through video games. And because of this, Eco discards many video game tropes, and it was made by many outsiders to the gaming scene. Ueda wanted to appeal to non-gamers, but like I said earlier, it's rarely a good idea to make a medium do something it's not made to do, and Eco is a very good example of this, because although they wanted to be different, Team Eco's design still pays tribute to the absolute ironclad rules of good game design. Eco plays as a 3D cinematic platformer with semi-fixed camera angles and an AI-controlled buddy in Yorda. It sees Eco and Yorda become fast friends, making up for each other's weaknesses 
As they escape an ancient castle, and it plays much like how one might expect, Ikyo can move around freely, jump, climb, fight, and perform prompt specific tasks like pull levers, carry bombs, or push crates. For the most part, players are solving environmental puzzles, but occasional combat sequences break out where they must above all else keep Yorda safe. Yorda is not able to climb or jump quite as freely as Iko, but only she can magic open the castle's numerous locked doors which bar the duo's progress. Puzzles mostly consist of manipulating the environment to make it accessible to Yorda, and combat mostly consists of making sure that the shadows cannot take her away. Our main character, Iko, is a horned boy who in the beginning is taken by a group of warriors to an ancient and by all appearances long since abandoned castle where they lock him inside a stone coffin for sacrifice. Iko is alone in the coffin for a time and dreams of a shadowy figure in a massive birdcage in the top of a tower. Eventually, a tremor knocks the coffin to the ground, opening it and releasing Iko which is where the player gets their hands on him, and the game starts to express its terms. The first task the game presents the player with is to pull a lever. Simple enough. But instead of text boxes or HUD items, the game presents goals with short cutscenes or level design and camera angles, and specifically the opening area does the latter. We have torches, a staircase, and a camera angle inviting us in the direction of the lever, and here's a little example of Team Eco playing on Street Smarts, Levers are never a non-usable feature in video game geometry, so everyone is going to figure to pull the one here, which is where the player learns the game's first lesson. No button prompts. We learn to experiment and find that the circle button pulls the lever. We now know how to interact with items and the next area teaches us to jump, as well as how to climb chains. Elevated geometry with no stairs but a clearly traversable area is an invitation to a jump, and the next area introduces ladders, which, like levers, are never non-usable geometry features. A lot of Eco's design is predicated on players being able to utilize common sense, and subtract design is a good idea here because the experience is so much more focused. After Eko has wandered the castle for a few minutes, he finds the cage from his dream, except instead of the shadowy figure, it's inhabited by an ethereal and pale girl, Yorda. Eko helps her from the cage, and the pair find themselves unable to talk to one another because of a language barrier. But what they can do is cooperate, a fitting hook for a video game, wouldn't you agree? They find in the other abilities they lack, and an unspoken agreement is struck, that they will help each other escape the castle. Eko is acrobatic and able to get to tight places, Yorda is able to open up the magically sealed doors. But their cooperation doesn't last very long before their first encounter with the shadows. These monsters appear to take Yorda away and if they succeed, Eko will be instantaneously petrified and the player must restart the game from their last save point. Some shade has been thrown at Eco's combat over the years, but I think it's one of the more successful combat systems of the 6th generation, considering what it's going for. Every mechanic, almost, in the game, in one way or another, feeds back into solidifying your relationship with Yorda, and the purpose of the combat is to make you protect her, and not only do I think the combat is, is, is genius, I'll go so far as to say that a fun combat system might have tarnished the game's legacy. For a comparison case, I direct you all to one of the 6th generation's best action games, Resident Evil 4. That game is all about optimizing your attacks to deal as much splash damage as you can, and it's one of the best action games ever made. But it periodically saddles you with protecting Ashley, and since that game is about the insane combat, protecting her drags down the intent of the combat. Effectively, in that game, Ashley is a roadblock to a truer realization of the game's experience. In Eco, the priorities are swapped. The combat, like most other features, exists solely to serve as your building a relationship with Yorda, and I think that the monotony of it helped steer anyone away from having fun, and in retrospect has obliterated any chance that Yorda be remembered as a hassle or a hurdle because the game really does not offer an avenue into evaluating as such. 
The environmental navigation is even softballed to make it more about getting her across than it is tightly executable jump puzzles or elaborate jump sequences. The puzzles are all conceptually simple with the challenge being in the execution and in relating the path to Yorda. Eco launched in 2001, a year before the first Ratchet and Clank and the same year as Jack and Daxter, which were among the PlayStation 2's most engaging platformers. So to say that Eco has conventionally boring platforming is not era inappropriate, seeing as there are numerous games on the same platform which did it way better, but to evaluate any of Eco's mechanics on conventional standards is also inappropriate, because although Ratchet and Jack had fun action platforming, they didn't have Yorda. Ueda's fingerprints are most evident in the character's movement, probably because these are where most of the animations are taking place, and the acting of the animations of the characters feeds back into how they play. Iko is a clumsy, somewhat hyper kid with little to no finesse or grace, whereas Yorda is so incredibly dainty that she can barely climb up a cliff. These animations are also what the game most heavily leans on to deliver emotion, and Ueda's skill as an animator really are brought into the forefront. There's simple stuff like when we meet Yorda's mother when she locks the castle doors. Yorda's mother has a predominantly black color scheme and visually is composed of predominantly sharp angles. Her voice is even harsher than Yorda's, and her appearance is very reminiscent of the shadows we've been fighting. That's how we're visually introduced to our bad guy, but gameplay-wise, we dislike her because she locked the gate on us and set back our progress. The next time we meet her will be after we reopen the gate and get on the bridge. Here, we see the game force Yorda to collapse when we run, and we find ourselves having to pick her back up in order to get across. But the bridge separates before we can get there, and Ego decides to jump back across for Yorda. Unfortunately, He's not tall enough to make the jump, so we see a brief roll reversal where Yorda tries helping him up a ledge. But to no avail, because Yorda's mom causes Yuko to collapse and separates the duo. Another reason for us to dislike her. Simple, but effective. Visually speaking, that scene is significant for a number of reasons, but something I want to note is that every time Yorda and the Queen share a scene, Yorda is shown in a submissive state. After being separated from Yorda, the world design takes a sharp turn to the colder, sharper, and lonelier. Eco has some truly inspired visuals, and in the beginning, we were running with Yorda in and out of the castle, and simultaneously juxtaposing the cozy interiors whose sounds consisted of crackling fires and echoes and warm exteriors, which housed the flapping of birds, the running of water, and the wind all the while being bathed in the sunlight. But now that Eco is alone, the levels get significantly bigger, for emphasis, and the number of player deaths suddenly spikes. The early game has two failure states, jump off a cliff and have Yorda be taken by a shadow. That's it. The late game also has two, jump off a cliff and die to the queen, but the former quickly becomes the most pronounced failure state in the entire game. There are so many leches to death in the final hour that you're sure to statistically die more often here than in the rest of the game combined, and that goes a long way to communicate the oppressive nature the late game levels radiate. But interestingly enough, it's an oppression that directly connects with being alone. Shadows won't come for Eco, it's just him, and that's a wrinkle the game adds to the separation with Yorda to make it more emotionally impactful. Here's another one. All throughout the game, we've been conditioned to keep Yorda close. If we left her for too long while we were solving some puzzle, a shadow would appear and try to take her away. And the end game plays on this conditioning, and almost every mechanic in the game is retooled to accommodate our separation with Yorda. Take save points, for example. Longtime followers of the channel, or anyone who's watched more than one video, will know that save points are among my favorite things to talk about with games, and it's because they are usually the most eventful mechanic games have. They can make or break games, and the ones in Eco I really like 
There are benches spread throughout the castle, which function as manual save points. The cool thing is, however, that you can't save by yourself. You need Yorda to sit down with you. Simple enough way to get her into saving, but in the end game, those benches are nowhere to be seen. The game starts autosaving. The jumps are more dangerous, so you'll retry more often, so autosaving makes a lot of sense, and its ramifications are that you'll likely die even more since there's less progress on the line with each jump. But all throughout the game, we've been conditioned to assign a sense of safety and relief with the side of these benches, and now in the end, that feeling is taken away from us. Another change brought in during the end game is seen in the level design. Whereas before, the levels felt immensely tight, and advancing properly seemed to be the most natural of all things to do in them, the end game has some comparatively questionable decisions. The large water room's camera, for example, while it does a good job of leading the player, is positioned in an awful angle for some of the more uh, angle-specific jumps. The early game draws on, above all else, common sense for its direction. There may be one or two places in the game where on my first playthrough many years ago, I had the wrong idea for how to advance, and this is because almost everything which isn't core to the experience is cut. You can apply common sense when you see a raised bridge and rope that swinging eco into the bridge will collapse it. You can likewise apply common sense that a piston can be used as a launch pad. The end game is all about communicating hostility, however, so the very first jump puzzle includes the first clearly poorly placed camera in the entire game. Eco himself is not mapped to a 360 degree movement scheme, so every jump is going to be angled less than absolutely laser focused. And the camera placements here and here are where people remember dying the most. Another example of questionable level design is in the room where we find the magic sword. Up until now, we've relied on Yorda's magic to open up sealed doors, but Tiziko is alone, he needs another way to do that, and the sword is the ticket. Other than that, it is functionally the same as the planks, or previous swords, except it vanquishes the shadows in one hit. The reason the sword room is questionable is because it includes an access to a sea, which is locked off, but the camera placement and location of the sword clearly push the player in that direction. Now compare this to the two door puzzle areas, whose geometry was so much more complex, yet so much better directed. There we had to gradually open up a few circular doors to let a ray through to open the castle gates. The way this was signaled was with a sword stuck in the gap of the first of these doors, which you'd only be able to pick up if you opened it which is information you'll store because this introductory door is the second of these you'll open. The first area is pulling you to go a bit deeper in, where you'll find another door like this, which you can open. This entire area is a soft track, which pulls from the best of the level design toolbox the developers had at their disposal, and the second of these areas then drew on your familiarity with the first, and then added complexity like having the ray firing machinery being out of angle, and some more natural feeling extensions of the rules set up in the first of these places. Conceptually simple, yet executionally complicated puzzles simplified with good use of camera placement and level design. I'll also note that those areas have some of my favorite integrations of Yorda into the environmental puzzles in the entire game. What's interesting about the late game area where we found the magic sword, however, is that it's a returning area from the opening cinematic. So, it's not a surprise that it leads right back to the game's beginning. We return to the beginning room and now find Yorda's petrified body, and are presented with the true form of the shadows. In early demos of the game, we can see that there were sections where Eco fights against warrior men, like those who originally brought him to the castle. This was cut for two reasons. One, nebulous technology limitation reasons, and two, it shifted focus away from Eco and Yorda's relationship, as it, assumably, gave the player an avenue to play out in their heads a revenge fantasy. 
Apply Subtract Design and the monsters were reduced to the shadows, whose sole purpose is to get the player to save Yorda. They aren't fun to fight, that it confused their purpose. Subtract Design is a fascinating philosophy because it means every element in the game has to justify its existence and be essential to the plot or else it's bloat. I'm sure that there are things which made it in for goofs. I know that the watermelon in the end was just something a team member made and they decided that uh, since the duo was on a beach they might as well be eating watermelons because the two have some association in Japan apparently. But the overwhelming majority of the minute to minute gameplay is spent engaging with an incredibly focused version of the team's creative vision. Eco's horns, for example, aren't just cosmetic. They're how we eventually connect the shadows to the room of sacrificed boys. They explain away why the tribe chose him for sacrifice, and they also serve to underscore the emotional climax of the final fight when the queen's attack breaks them clean off. It's really disturbing to see Eco without them in such a ruthless manner. The queen plans to use Yorda to rebirth herself because she wants to live forever. And the petrified Yorda in the room of sacrificed boys is a haunting image because the only other example of petrification the game has had up until now was Eco when a shadow successfully captured Yorda. Seeing her petrified in the end ties back then to a failure state which the player most likely is familiar with. Not groundbreaking in and of itself, but another example of subtract design. Present players with a bleak visual they know from playing. And that's not the only haunting element which builds up the final boss fight. The music which plays while Eco captures the spirit of the boys is chilling, and their arm flapping motion is truly disturbing. It's simplistic, but very effective at communicating the wrongness of this scene. Aside from a haunting buildup, the Queen has also been shown to be formidable on some other fronts. Intellectually, we know that she speaks at least two languages. We know that she can teleport across the map and seems less than enthused to personally engage with Eco before the final fight, almost like she thought it was completely beneath her. We've thus far been made to connect Yorda with the idea of power because of her immense utility, but every time we see the Queen and Yorda together, like I said earlier, the latter has had a submissive demeanor. She was hobbled on the bridge and kept collapsing. Her softness and bright colors are juxtaposed with the queen's black and sharp design, etc. Two failed escape attempts in, the queen separated the player from Yorda, so ludologically we have a lot of motivation to dislike her. And the final boss is a good, I think, representation of both the queen and Eco. Her attacks are the petrification waves, which were unleashed by the shadows capturing Yorda, and they serve as one-hit kills bar Eco managing to either hide behind the movable pillars or him holding the magic sword which the queen so fears. And when in her death, she decides to lash out at Eco and break his horns, man, it is chilling. When we first met Yordam, she was a shadowy apparition in Eko's dream, and when she comes in the end to save him from the castle's collapse, we see her in that form again. I wonder if there's some narrative significance to this, or whether it was done to have her human form in the post credit scene be a bigger reveal. Maybe they wanted to put distance between her and Eko, or maybe they wanted to remind us of how we first saw her to have us quickly recap the events of the game in our heads and underscore the relationship we've built with her. I don't know, but I like it. From the beginning, we've seen Eko and Yorda grow to become a pretty good duo. We've seen Eko help Yorda make jumps, we've seen Yorda attempt to do the same for Eko. I complained a bit earlier about Eko's octagonal or whatever movement scheme, but I must admit that it makes Eko super clumsy. And We've taken this clumsy kid and his dainty friend through quite an adventure. An adventure which blended the best of practical, good game design principles with the era's cutting edge technology. Splatter textures under chains to help the player navigate 3D spaces, inverse kinematics for walking down steps and holding Yorda's hand. And the game also employs some pretty shameless tricks to pull at the heartstrings. Before the bridge was separating, Yorda kept collapsing, so we kept having to raise her up. When Eko jumped, he dropped his weapon. Completely irrelevant, considering that the shadows 
don't attack him when he's alone, but visually notable, because it means that Ico has been stripped of literally every tool he's acquired in the adventure so far, and is starting from zero again. Except this time, his environments actively communicated hostility, and there was no Yorda to lighten things up. Yorda's AI isn't perfect, but when it malfunctions, it usually just results in her climbing up a random box, which, I don't know, I've come to see it as sort of endearing. I know that I'm hand-waving away what is clearly not supposed to be happening, but I don't know, I like to read it as Yorda and Iko having their own little sense of humor which transcends their language barrier. And I think the reason I accept this headcanon rather than see it for what it really is, is because I buy these characters. In the end, we feel what it's like to be separated from Yorda, because we're not playing the same game anymore. Throughout the whole game, we've been conditioned to not leave Yorda alone for too long, lest the shadows come to claim her, and the end game separation plays on our desire to not want to see Eco without her. That is a strong case for Eco's lunar narrative achievements, but it's not the only one. Half of the player animations are Eco tripping over himself, underscoring his character. The game prioritizes keeping Yorda safe over defeating the monsters. Having her get to an area's end is enough. Yorda's dainty animations play on the old monkey brain and makes us want to protect her, and her endgame turnaround when an unconscious and immensely vulnerable Eco is taken care of by her, and he's sent out safely from the collapsing castle feels all the more impactful for the role reversal. The post credit scene sees Eco wake up on a beach and it's a visual neck snap because it's very different from everything we've seen so far. It's a nature area. And since one side of the beach is locked off by a cliff and the camera points in the other direction anyways, the only thing that makes sense is to head in that open direction and when we meet Yorda again, in human form, it's incredibly satisfying. Until you watch the interview where Weta said that this is a dream sequence. Eco is a very special game, but on paper, it seems like people shouldn't think so much of it. If you were to describe it to the layman, it'd be very fair to say that it's an underwhelming game. Its platforming is nothing to write home about, its combat is laughable, its visuals, while gorgeous, lack the punch of its spiritual sequels, but none of these are the point of the game. Rather, it is the relationship between Eco and Yorda, and all those other elements are tuned to service that relationship. The combat could easily have been more engaging, but if it was fun to fight, then the focus on keeping Yorda safe might be lost. If the platforming was fun, then getting Yorda from A to B might have been remembered as a drag. The game is incredibly underwhelming on many conventional fronts, but it's all in service of building an exceptional relationship between you and Yorda, so it's very good that that investment pays off. The game utilized unintelligible subtitles and fake languages for two reasons. To communicate a barrier, one broken by holding the AI's hand, and to give you a sense that the characters were expressing more than words can say. And that second one might be Eco's greatest success. It says something only a video game can. No other medium has the audience hold hands with someone, and this comes back to what we talked about in the beginning, about the value of not using mediums in ways they aren't meant to be used. There are a lot of things games frankly are not good at, but a narrative that has to do with interaction is one games above all other mediums are primed to tell. Eco realized this and told an incredibly unique story. There are not many games of Eco's pedigree, so I hope I've done it justice. Thanks for watching. And stay tuned, because next week we'll be going over Kingsfield 4, The Ancient City. I'm uh, still operating this channel on the bi-monthly release schedule where every month I swap between making some videos for you guys and making my game. Last month I finalized the world design of the overworld, overhauled the enemy movement scheme, wall collisions, created a few basic NPC storylines and a couple of boss battles. After about 8 months of production, the game is finally taking on a face I can recognize and 
I'm going to spend September making some more enemies, a slew of interiors and filling the world with more NPCs. Next October I'll make videos for you guys again, and I plan to cover Shadow Tower and maybe Thief. Just a little heads up though, I've been working on a secret video which might see the light of day soon, but if forces out of my hand delay it I'll hopefully put together the Thief video, or alternatively I'll try knocking out both of the uh, Shadow Towers. Long-time followers will know that this has been a From Software heavy year for the channel, and that's no coincidence, I've been building up to something special. In the beginning, hopefully, of next year, I plan to release the Bloodborne commentary. If this interests you, I recommend subscribing and clicking the bell icon to receive notifications. Also like and comment for all of that good old interacting with the algorithm. Aside from the channel, I can be found on Twitter, same name, and on the Essays and Espresso podcast. The footage I used in this video was supplied by Project Longplay, which is linked in the description box below. And also linked below is my Patreon, where I give early access to videos to members. Right now, you can catch the Kingsfield 4 analysis early for as little as a buck. I hope this video was worth the time you spent watching it. I've been Asia Aesthetics, and until next time... Take care.